Lori meets Saul. So, Lori, princess, is your husband here a Meshuggah or what? Mr. Lewis, Alex is not my husband. We're only sixteen years old. Besides, I told you, he's my best friend. He has no romantic interest in me at all. I know. That's why he's a Meshuggah. There are certain things on Earth that just don't mix. Oil and water come to mind. Cobras and mongooses. Lit cigarettes and barrels of dynamite. Alcohol and lawn gnomes. But if there was ever a combination that filled my heart with terror and dread, that recipe for disaster was Lori and Saul. Of course, I was still best friends with Lori. Ever since my hearing, she had stopped bugging me about the accident. At first, she had been trying to show sympathy because of the whole driver's license thing. Now she was just too busy enjoying my tales of misery. Every Wednesday and Friday in homeroom, she would dash up to me with a barely hidden grin and ask, How was your visit with Saul last night? So I'd tell her the highlights. He suckered me in poker and froze my leg, or he called me a chimp, or he hid Mrs. Goldfarb's wig in the planter again. Lori's eyes would sparkle with demented pixie dust as she said, So when can I meet this guy? What was a boy to do? For someone who always scolded me about my bad ideas, she sure was blind to her own disaster potential. Can you imagine what he'd say to her? What she'd say to him? What they would do to each other? I had visions of epic battles with remote controls, wheelchairs, Chinese throwing stars pinging off the old man's oxygen tank. But somehow, it never crossed my mind that the irresistible force and the immovable object would become fast friends. So here we were at the historic first meeting. Maybe I should hit the rewind button so you can catch the whole painful encounter. It was a Friday night, and Lori stopped by my house. Mom was walking in frantic little circles in the kitchen, getting ready for her second big first date. The original Mr. Wright hadn't wanted to see her again after my little vehicular adventure interrupted their evening. Mom was afraid I'd do something stupid while she was out, and Lori saw her chance to strike. Mrs. Gregory, I have the perfect way to keep Alex out of trouble. So do I, but the child welfare people think it's cruel and unusual to cage him up with the dog again. That mom of mine in her wacky child abuse humor. This might be less satisfying for you, but it's totally legal. Want to hear it? Lori, sweetheart, could you get my top button in the back there? Okay, what's the plan? I'll take custody of the boy and bring him on the bus to the nursing home to visit Mr. Lewis. Ignoring my gasp, my dirty look, and my vicious ankle kick, she continued with her charming the parent's voice. We'll kill three birds with one stone. You will be free for the evening, and Alex won't have access to a car. Alex will get in some extra hours with Mr. Lewis and impress the probation people, and I won't have to sit home all alone because my loser best friend is grounded. Hmm, let me think for a minute. Is this necklace too clunky for the dress? No, it's nice. So what do you think of the plan? Sorry, honey, but Alex is staying put. I smiled, and it was Lori's turn to kick my ankle. Mrs. Gregory, why don't you wear the little gold hoop earrings? They really set off your eyes. I already said no, dear. My mom picked up her tiny, fancy-looking purse thingy. I know. I just think you should be well accessorized for your big night. You have your cell phone, right? Yes, but why? Alex knows where I'll be. At the Pluto Grill on the river. Lori gave me her sweetest and most sinister smile. Alex knows where you'll be, but the police and ambulance crews don't. Just then, a car horn beeped outside. My mom looked at Lori. Lori grinned at my mom. Mom snarled. Oh, take him, you rotten thing. But you will have him home by the time I get back. Then she realized this had come out sounding a tad harsh, so she gave Lori a quick hug and muttered, Take care of him for me, okay? Mom dashed out of the door before I could mention my own vast, legendary ability to take care of myself. Lori turned to me and said, Grab your coat and don't get too carried away thanking me. You'll make me blush. I was too mad to say much on the bus ride, but as we got off the bus and started walking into the home, I couldn't let Lori go in there without a warning. Even the queen of manipulation deserved some preparation before she headed into battle. So I gave her all of the tips I'd picked up. Go easy on the eye contact. Never show friendliness. 
don't go out on a limb with personal information, opinions, or observations. She wanted to know what she could do. Run away home, child, was all I could come up with. Nurse Claudel came around the corner as we were emerging from the elevator, overheard the end of my speech, and clucked her tongue at me. Why are you telling tales on our Mr. Lewis? Don't listen to this one, honey. Solomon Lewis is a fine old gentleman. By the way, Alex, where have you been hiding this sweet little thing? Hi, my name is Claudel Green. I'm the charge nurse on the unit here. You must be very proud of Alex. We got him all worried about Mr. Lewis before his first visit, but he marched in there like a trooper and things have been going fine ever since. Isn't that right, Alex? I spluttered. He... you... you all said he was... Wait, she's not a sweet little thing. She's my friend Laurie. Claudel clucked again. Ms. Laurie, you've got a nice boy here. If he ever learns some manners and starts telling you that you are a sweet little thing... I stomped into Saul's room just to get away from the baffling female madness. Saul was reading Hemingway this time, The Old Man and the Sea. He held up the book for me to comment, but before I could say anything, he started in. Ah, Mr. Um, so nice to see you, and on a Friday, no less. Did you come by to give me an extra literature lesson? Some poker advice, maybe. Then he saw Laurie over my shoulder and broke into a mammoth grin. It was like a friendly, body-snatching alien had abducted him and taken his place. I figured those thin little lips would snap under the unaccustomed tension, but they held. Oh, and you brought a friend. Isn't that what the young men are calling their young ladies these days? Lori beamed right back at him. Hadn't she listened to my advice at all? Hello, Mr. Lewis. My name is Lori. I'm so glad to meet you. Alex talks about you all the time. Good golly. This was turning into some sort of sickening love fest. About me, he talks. When he's looking into those pretty eyes of yours, it's not about me a friend should be talking. On second thought, at any moment, Saul was probably going to trigger Laurie's fabled anti-sexist death stare, and then we'd all be diving for cover. Oh, stop it, Mr. Lewis. Alex and I are just best friends. With the way he's looking at you, I figure I should start calling him your husband. Friend, Mr. Lewis. F-R-I-E-N-D. Friend. Husband, Lori, darling, trust me. Husband. Friend, amigo, buddy. You know, like pal, friend, husband. Friend. Which is where we came in a few minutes ago. I couldn't believe this. Lori and Saul were bantering or sparring or flirting or something. Not that I cared, aside from the creepiness. Since she and I were just friends, after all. And what did Saul mean exactly about the way I looked at her? Wait. The guy was old, grumpy, and at least half insane. Why was I even thinking about this? I needed to clear my head. Saul, since you and my wife are hitting it off so well... I think I'll just go fill out my time forms at the nurse's station, okay? He didn't even look away from Lori, but kind of waved his hand at me in dismissal. I walked out, trying to tune out the conspiratorial laughter behind me, and sat down behind the desk at the station. Claudel was there drinking coffee. She started talking with me about her kids, her husband's health problems, and her aching feet, and I listened for a good long while. She was a pretty interesting lady when she wasn't teasing me. Plus, it was easier than trying to handle the two-headed runaway freight train of Saul and Lori. But eventually, Claudel let out a huge sigh and eased herself back onto her sore tootsies. If she was getting back into action, I supposed I should be too. Back in the room, the scene was a shocker. Saul was sitting in his chair, and Lori was fluffing the pillows on his bed. Lori, honey pie, you might be prettier than Alex, but when he makes my bed, he does hospital corners. Floppy sheets is not my idea of comfortable. And this water, it's uh, too warm. Alex always gets me ice from the fourth floor. But, Mr. Lewis, I don't usually do those. Lori spun and cut me off. You don't make his bed? No, the nurse's aides do that. You don't fluff his pillows? Nope. But you do go get him water, right? Nah. -uh. 
Lori looked back and forth from me to Saul, whose facial expression was starting to look familiar. So I'm guessing you never, um, rub his feet? Saul finally broke out with his booming bark. Gotcha! I told her not to be nice to him, but apparently wives never listen. Saul gets interested. The next week, I got to Saul's late because I had jazz band practice after school. We'd gotten this new chart called Jump In With Symphony Sid, and I was struggling with it. The accents were all in really strange places, so I kept hitting the accented notes at the wrong time. Or I'd get the timing right, but concentrate so hard on that that I'd slip into the wrong key. Then the conductor, Mr. Watrous, would stop the band and try to correct me, which was embarrassing. I never did get it right at the rehearsal, but Mr. Watrous must have decided to just ignore my spastic rhythm and blatant pitch errors. So anyhow, that's why I was late. And Saul wasn't in his room. At the nurse's station, Juanita Case was on duty. She seemed a little annoyed that she'd missed the big night with Lori, which had provided endless hours of laughter for the staff when Saul had told them about it. Still, having missed the original action didn't disqualify her from picking on me about it. So, how's the pillow fluff girl? Will she be back soon? Saul's pillows are looking a mite droopy. Oh, please give me a break, Miss Case. I just spent an hour getting publicly humiliated in jazz band at school, and now I have to see Saul. I'm not sure how much more I can take it one day. How did they humiliate you up at that school? Oh, it wasn't the school, it was me. I just couldn't get my parts right today. Well, baby, Saul is at hydrotherapy right now, and he won't be back for a good half hour. Why don't you close yourself up in his room and practice that guitar? So I did. I set up my music on the edge of the bed, sat in the chair with my teller, and played through Jumpin' with Symphony Sid over and over. After about fifteen minutes, I was starting to get the rhythm and the notes right at the same time, as long as I didn't try to think about what I was doing. The instant I started to think, I'd mess up again. My old middle school English teacher, Miss Palmer, used to talk to my class about how we should be writing Zen masters who could think without thinking. Weird, right? She always said writing was like bike riding, and that if you ever stopped and thought about how you were balancing on your bike, you'd fall. Even though I thought Miss Palmer might have spent a little too much time on mountaintops, I never forgot the advice. So while I was playing this piece, I concentrated so hard on not concentrating that I didn't hear Saul being wheeled in behind me until he started whistling the melody of the song over the chords I was playing. I stopped and turned to say hi. So, today you're serenading me, Mr. Rum. To what do I owe this privilege? Is it maybe sing to a fossil day? And why is your music paper on my bed? I'm telling you, the service around here is slipping without that lovely Lori girl here. I jumped up, almost dropping the teller in the process, and grabbed up the sheet music with a fast sweep of my hand. I'm sorry, Saul. I was just early for our visit so I decided to use the time practicing. Wait a minute, Mr. Rum. You weren't early, you were late. Just because I can't breathe doesn't mean I can't tell time. And what is that thing in your lap? It's a guitar. This much I know. I mean, what is it doing in your lap? Well, I play it. I mean, I play in the school jazz band. I'm not very good, but I... Saul got out of the wheelchair and into bed. You play fine. I knew what song it was, didn't I? Now why don't you make yourself useful and play for me? Well, I don't know many of this kind of songs. Plus, I don't even have my amplifier with me, so it's not going to be loud enough. So play what you know as loud as you play. It has to be better than hearing your thoughts on Hemingway. I promise, I won't criticize. Well, that would be a refreshing change anyway. I took out the only other sheet music I had in my case, which was a Miles Davis tune from the 1960s called All Blues. I carried it around and played it all the time because it was much easier than most of the jazz we played in school. I used to try to get Mr. Watrous to call for it at every rehearsal so I could have three minutes of not feeling like a complete half-wit. I also just liked Miles Davis. I once read a book about him for a biography project at school. He was tough and confident and used to play with his back to the audience sometimes because he didn't care what people thought. So, of course, they all flipped over him. 
Women used to line up to meet him, and he was like a rock star before there even were rock stars. He was kind of like Laurie with a trumpet in a lot of ways. Anyhow, I got the music arranged on the nightstand, counted it off to myself, one, two, three, one, two, three, and started playing. I was nervous, so I started the song at a pretty quick tempo. Slower, Sal muttered. So I slowed down. I looked up about halfway through the chart, and his eyes were closed. His face looked almost peaceful, and his breathing was the quietest it had ever been in my presence. I figured I was either impressing him or putting him in a coma. For the last chorus, I played harder and more rhythmically, and Saul's fingers started rubbing together in the ghost of a snap. So he was dialed into what I was playing, which was both cool and scary. When I stopped, and the last dominant seventh chord was still floating in the air, like a bell you might have once heard in a sad dream, Saul opened his eyes and looked at me. I couldn't read anything in his expression at all. Did he like the song? Did he think I'd played well? Was he really not going to criticize? More, he whispered hoarsely. More. I couldn't believe it. I had found something I could do that Solomon Lewis liked. And try as I might, I couldn't see a gotcha angle anywhere. November 22nd. Dear Judge Trent, I am writing today with my first piece of positive news. As you may remember from my hearing, I play the guitar and am a member of my high school's jazz band. This week, Mr. Lewis asked me to play my guitar for him, and I did. The playing seemed to entertain him. As I was leaving for the day, Mr. Lewis even told me, If you ever want to practice more for somebody old and defenseless, feel free. I'm stuck here in bed anyway. Which is the kindest thing he has said to me yet. I don't know how this will allow me to learn a lesson or teach one, but at least while I'm playing the guitar, Mr. Lewis is not mocking me, swindling me, or spilling icy beverages on my innocent flesh. Thank you for your faith in me. Sincerely, Alex Gregory. Half an Answer In December, there was a serious cold snap. My mom finally ungrounded me so I could go shopping for her Christmas presents. But I spent tons of time in my basement practicing my jazz tunes for Saul. I even bought a tiny amplifier, the size of a Walkman, so I could play a little louder during my visits, even though the extra thirty dollars added six hours to my sentence at the home. And twice a week, I dragged my Tella and the mini-amp onto the bus and up to Saul's room. One day, I had just walked in when Saul asked me, Where's your little wife, Lori? We're friends, Saul. About this, my grandmother had a saying, That means, half an answer also says something. Whatever. Do you want to hear something new I've been working on just for you? Ah, oh, just for me, eh? Not for your tremendous worldwide audience, then? Ha ha. Do you want to hear it or not? Who says I don't want to hear it? I'm sitting here, aren't I? You're a very sensitive boy, Alex. You have to toughen up or the world will be a hard place for you. I'm not sensitive, Saul. You have no idea how strong I am. Oh, and you have an idea how strong you are. How do you know, with the easy life you kids are having nowadays? Strong schmong. Anyhow, Saul, I'm going to play now. And I played a piece I had dug out of the jazz band folder at school. I wanted to do something that Saul would know was just for him. So I found the medley from this play called Fiddler on the Roof. It's about a Jewish guy in the old country somewhere whose daughter wants to marry a guy who's not Jewish. I figured he would like to hear something a little different, and maybe he could relate to it or something. I had worked really hard on the piece, because the school's music was only for the piano, and it's hard to rewrite piano music for the guitar. Actually, it was probably the most effort I had put into anything since before my dad moved out. The medley starts out with this funny song called Tradition. It's a big oompa, oompa kind of thing, and pretty fast. Then it segues into Matchmaker, Matchmaker, which is the easiest part, a fast waltz with a simple melody. Next comes another oompa part called To Life, which is the translation of a Jewish toast, 
L'chaim. I was pretty proud that I knew that. Saul always said it right before he swallowed his pills. Anyway, the part after that is called Sunrise Sunset. It's a song the father sings about how he can't believe his daughter is old enough to move out and get married. It's a bittersweet kind of waltz, and was really pretty when I didn't mess up the big finger stretches I had to pull off in order to play through its chord changes, which was about 40% of the time. But hey, I was trying. So, I started playing. You know how in, like, a Disney movie or something, the princess will start singing, and all the birds and bees and deer and stuff will gather around to listen? This was a lot like that. But the birds, bees, and deer had walkers, wigs, and hearing aids. Residents came in. Nurses came in. Mrs. Goldfarb almost came in, but she couldn't quite get herself to enter Saul's room, so she was just sort of leaning on the doorframe. Tradition flew by under my fingers. Matchmaker, matchmaker might have been a tad slow, but when I looked over at Saul, he was nodding in time, like he was conducting me with his fearsome eyebrow. To life was great. I had the little gypsy-sounding rhythm part really snapping along. And then I started to ease my way into Sunrise Sunset. But as soon as I played maybe the fourth note of the first line, Is This the Little Girl I Carried?, I chanced to look at Saul again, and what I saw made my fingers trip and crash all into one another, like the Three Stooges had suddenly taken possession of my digits. His head was bowed to his chest, and it looked as though he was crying silently. I stumbled through the rest of the song, and all of the assembled oldsters clapped, but by the end all I wanted was to find out what was wrong with Saul. As soon as the others started walking out, I turned to the bed. Saul, are you all right? No response. Saul? Mr. Lewis? He ignored me just long enough for the clacking of the last cane to fade off down the hallway, and then looked up. His eyes were still brimming and bloodshot. I'm fine, Alex. What? A man can't be moved by some music once in a while. But I didn't mean to make you upset. This was supposed to be like your Hanukkah present. Alex, Alex, I'm not upset. You gave me a very nice present. New socks I don't need. A sweater from the mall I don't want. Music I like. And you played all right today. I did? Don't fish for a compliment, boy chick. It's not dignified. I'm not saying you should quit your day job and head for Broadway. But you're learning something. He watched without saying anything as I packed up my guitar, and I wondered why that one song would make him so emotional. I was feeling rather brave since I had been such a big musical hit with him lately, so I asked, Saul, was there something about that sunrise song that bothered you? He smiled tightly without showing a single tooth. I didn't so much enjoy the part where you lost the time and played all the wrong notes. Other than that, I'm fine. Right before he kicked me out of his room for the day, I told him a saying I just heard. Half an answer also says something. Happy Holidays Christmas break was looking grim. I planned to visit the old man every day of the vacation so I could really pack in the hours, but that wasn't exactly a one-way ticket to party land. <laughs> Plus, Lori was in New York with her mom until just before New Year's Eve, and my mom was working double shifts at the home so that other people can enjoy time with their families. What was I, her dog? Her goldfish, maybe? A really, really underqualified chauffeur? Of course, my mom wasn't my whole family, and the missing one-third of our little trio was sitting on mom's front step one day when I got back from a day at the home. Dad looked tired and kind of old. I stopped about ten feet in front of him, wondering how long he'd been sitting there in the freezing weather, with nothing but a suit jacket to keep him warm and his expensive wingtip shoes frosted in the drifting snow. He's some kind of junior vice president guy at the local bank and is always dressed super fancy, even hours after work. But for the first time I could ever remember, his face was completely covered in stubble. Hi, Alex. Uh, hi, Dad. It's been a while, you know, I called a few times. 
Yeah, I've been really busy with my community service and school, and the SATs are coming up. I was going to call you, but, you know... And I sent you some emails. Yeah, my stupid mail server has been acting up. Well, that would explain why you blocked all messages from my address, I suppose. What a relief. I thought you were mad at me. Boy, between Mom's sarcasm and Dad's, Lori's, and Saul's, it's a wonder I even stay sane. Anyway, I just came by to see you before... before... well, I'm going out of town for a while. What do you mean, out of town? I've accepted a job in Philadelphia. It starts on January 15th. But that's like an hour and a half away. It's in a whole other state. I know. That's why it's considered out of town. Are uh, you taking the home record with you? You mean Sandy? Ah, uh, yeah, a Mrs. Simonson, my third grade teacher who made you break up with Mom. She didn't make... Oh, whatever, Alex. Things aren't as simple as they appear to you. No, she isn't coming with me. We broke up a few weeks ago. That's one of the things I was calling to tell you. So why are you moving? I need a change, Alex. I need to get away from all this. He made a sweeping gesture that took in everything around, including his only son. Well, thanks for telling me. I guess leaving Mom and me wasn't enough of a change, huh? Look, Alex, I didn't come here to fight... You're just wrong about this. I didn't leave your mother. She kicked me out. Like I said, things aren't so simple. People are complicated and contrary. Mom kicked you out? I don't believe it. Well, I don't want to say anything bad about your mother, but she did. Why? That's not important, Alex. What's important is that I'm trying to be your father, and you aren't letting me. You're trying to be my father by moving out of state? Wow, thanks for the show of support. It's not like that, Alex. Look, do you remember when Wink died? Wink was our cat when I was five. He ran out in front of a car because I had left the front door open and he'd gotten out. My parents had hidden the truth from me for weeks. Yeah. Are you trying to tell me he really just moved to Philadelphia? Dad nearly smiled. And he suddenly looked a lot like my old dad, my little league coaching, arm wrestling before bed, taking long walks to see the turtles in the park, dad. No, I'm saying sometimes parents try to shield their kids from hard facts. Maybe one day mom will be willing to tell you why she told me to leave. But that's between you and her. Mom's car turned the corner at the head of our block, and my dad jumped up from the snowy stoop. Gotta go, kid. Are we friends? I don't know, Dad. I'll call you. Does your phone still work? My cell does. He struggled a bit with his frozen hands and his ice-cold car keys, but still managed to get the door of his fast little midlife crisis mobile open before Mom could pull up and start arguing. He ruffled my hair, which he hadn't done since maybe sixth grade, hopped in the car, and zoomed off. If he had told me the truth about the divorce, then he wasn't the bad guy. So who was? Mom walked over to me. What was that about? Philadelphia, Mom. Philadelphia the city? No, Philadelphia the cream cheese. Tough family. The next time I went to Saul's, it was three days after Christmas, and also the first night of Hanukkah. I hadn't prepared another special song or anything, so I stopped and bought Saul a book about jazz history. He was sitting in his chair, staring at a huge vase of white flowers on his nightstand. The vase had a blue and white bow around it. Saul had a transparent tube wrapped around his head and stuck right under his nose. The tube made a constant hissing noise, so he didn't hear me until I was right in front of him. He looked groggy and only gave me a little nod. Even that looked like a big effort. What the heck? I decided he'd explain if he wanted to, and that I'd pretend everything was normal. Saul, how are you? Happy Hanukkah. He muttered. Happy Hanukkah. Where's... Your guitar. I didn't bring it today, but I got you a book about jazz. It's called Monk, and it's about this great, crazy piano player named Thelonious Monk. Have you ever heard of him? The next thing Saul said sounded a lot like, I knew him. 
but of course it was hard to make out the exact words, and I didn't want to make Saul talk more than he had to, so I just nodded. Nice flowers. Who brought them? It had never occurred to me that Saul might have other visitors. I did. Claudel went to the store with me on her day off for my daughter, Judy. Oh! She's a hotshot lawyer, very smart, very busy. They're beautiful. I'm sure she'll love them. Yeah, yeah. She always liked flowers. Her mother, too. Always with the flowers. <laughs> Saul, did you get me any flowers? Saul, let's plant a garden. Saul, those are gorgeous. A little past there. <laughs> Prime, maybe. <coughs> but nice. He took a few moments to catch his breath and let go of his memories, and I spoke over his gasps. Are you comfortable? Can I get you anything? Does this, to you, look so comfortable? <laughs> well, I, I mean, what happened? Nothing. I was walking in the store with Claudel. Such a heart that girl has, like gold. Anyway, I walked too far. So, now, I need a little breathing help, that's all. Can they do anything to make it better? Well, they're giving me. He touched the tube around his face. Oxygen and breathing treatments. And some pills, I don't know. <laughs> Is it working? If I'm not dead, it's working. If I die, he'll... <laughs> no, it wasn't maybe working so good. I had never asked him about his health before but now seemed like as good a time as any. They told me when I started here that you have emphysema. How long have you had it? A million years. I don't know. Boy, chick. Too long. How did you get it? It's funny, Alex. You smoke a million, two million <laughs> cigarettes and they don't hurt you. But you take one... Puff, of number two million and one, and all of a sudden you're <laughs> in the hospital. Do you smoke? No. Good. Don't start, or I'll have to get up and give you a clap on the tuchis. He looked up at me, and his eyes were more tired than I'd ever thought eyes could be. Lesson over. Class... <laughs> <laughs> dismissed. Now get out of here and let an old man read in peace. I stopped at the nurse's station where Claudel was talking with Leonora. She never comes. We buy her them damn flowers every year, but she never comes. And now her daddy's all wired up in there. I heard the paramedics almost had to intubate him. Forget that. They almost had to shock him right in the middle of aisle five of Kmart. It was like he was the blue coat special. But he got his flowers for Judy, the big shot lawyer. A shame. He's really almost a sweet man sometimes. You got it a little mixed up, Leo. Sometimes he's sweet, and sometimes he's almost a man. They both laughed a little, and then their voices subsided as they turned their attention to me. Clodell spoke. How are you today, Alex? Is he going to die? Not today, child. Not today. He's a tough old thing, don't you worry. You'll get in your hundred hours before this is all over. This made me mad. That's not why I asked. I'm sorry, baby. I know that. Saul will be all right in a day or two, long as he doesn't get the pneumonia again, like Mrs. Johnson last spring. Who's Mrs. Johnson? I don't think I've seen her around. Both women just looked at me blankly until I realized I wasn't ever going to see Mrs. Johnson around. I had to get out of there. I mumbled something about having to catch my bus and headed for the elevator like I was getting off a sinking ship, at least for a couple of days. 
Not that I had been keeping count, no matter what Claudel had said. But I still had forty-four hours left with Mr. Lewis. December 27th Dear Judge Trent, I am just checking in with my December update. It was a hard month, but I think I may have learned a lesson. You can't just throw somebody out of your life when they displease you. Mr. Lewis has this daughter somewhere who's a lawyer, and every year he buys her flowers for Hanukkah. He puts them on his nightstand, and then he waits, and waits for the daughter to show up and get them. But she never does. Maybe he's so grouchy because his daughter doesn't love him. I'm getting used to his grumpiness, though. He threatened today to give me a clop on the tuchus, which I looked up and learned as a smack on the butt. However, he actually said it kind of affectionately. I know I am halfway done with my mandated hundred hours of community service, and just a few weeks ago I was counting the days with glee. However, am I allowed to keep this job past the one hundred hours if I wish to do so? It just seems that Mr. Lewis could use the company more than I could use the free time, especially since I can't drive and my family is falling apart anyway. Sincerely, Alex Gregory the ball falls. On New Year's Eve day, I messed some things up. I don't know why, because I woke up in a fine mood. My plan for the day was to practice guitar for a couple of hours, and then maybe go over to see Saul after lunch. My mom had a date that night, which made two nights in a row, and Lori was going to come over and have a little loser geek slumber party with me. When I got to the kitchen, I made a big pot of coffee and got out Mom's favorite mug— which, for some reason, featured my first-grade Mother's Day drawing of three Ninja Turtles under a tree with a huge machine gun. When I was little, I used to make coffee for both of my parents and serve it to them in bed sometimes. They would sit up, and I would climb between them with my own special coffee drink, which was really just nuked milk with sugar in it. There were days we sat there snuggled up, playing little tickle games and laughing for hours. Or at least, it seemed like that to me. And no matter how hot my feet got under the covers with my footy PJs on, I never, ever wanted to be the first one to leave the bed. Interestingly enough, that honor generally fell to my dad. Okay, enough of my sob stories. The thing was, I had the feeling my mom's date the night before hadn't been so ultra-groovy because she had marched in at maybe 9 p.m. without saying a word to me and stomped off to bed. So I made her the pot of coffee for old time's sake— or to cheer her up, or possibly just because I am just a much more swell son than you may have gathered thus far. When she came down, the obvious depressed mom danger signs were there. The puffy eyes, the ancient terry cloth bathrobe, even the dreaded hair curlers. This was a woman who probably needed to skip caffeine and go right into electroshock therapy. But since I didn't have the right equipment for home mom zapping, I filled the mug and held it out to her. She said, Do I look that bad? No, Mom, I just had the coffee all made anyway, so I figured you could put your feet up, relax, and enjoy a cup. Why would you look bad? Oh, uh, nothing, I'll be fine. Not, I'm fine, I noticed. I'll be fine, which is different. Do you want to talk? She looked at me and snapped. What, should I be getting my life advice from you of all people? Holy crap, that was basically uncalled for. Okay, Mom, I'm going out now. Have a nice day and a happy new year. She may have been shouting wait and trying to apologize as I left the house, but with my Walkman on and blasting, I just saw a weird, scary lady in a bathrobe standing on our porch with her arms waving. My next stop was the home. I was starving, so I picked up some candy and a pack of cookies from a vending machine in the lobby and gulped most of it down in the elevator. When I walked into Saul's room, he looked a lot better. His oxygen tube thing was gone, and he was pacing back and forth. The white flowers were gone, too. Good afternoon, Mr. Rum, he said almost cheerfully. How are you today? I like the book you gave me, even though Monk was a more interesting man in person. I had to ask. You met Thelonious Monk? Many times. What, you think I was born here? I had a very interesting life in the old days. I'm sure you did. 
Anyway, how were your holidays, Alex? At that moment, I could have tried to stop Saul from changing the subject, but I just didn't feel like risking an argument. Naturally, I got one anyway, and I missed some info that could have changed everything. Fine. We were both big communicators today. Fine, he says. What fine? How are things? Did you get nice presents? How are your parents? How is the little wife? I hope you're taking her somewhere special tonight. Hey, maybe you could drop by here with her on your way to do your young people monkey business. Young people monkey business? Saul, we're just staying in tonight at my house, if you really want to know. Without a chaperone? Better you should come here. We'll get some cups and some drinks, and I'll keep the two of you from doing anything you might regret. Saul, nothing is going to happen between us. We're just friends. My mom trusts us, so why can't you? Sure, she trusts you. She isn't a man. She doesn't know how you think. I remember how it is to be with a beautiful girl, alone, in the moonlight. But do what you think is best. Okay, I get the point, Sol. I'm a deranged hormonal fiend, and no female is safe anywhere near me, even if she's a deadly martial arts expert. And we're just friends. So you want us to come here tonight? Boy, check, he said, reaching over to grab a pack of licorice out of my hand. I thought you'd never ask. Wow. I had spoken to only two people the whole day, one who bit my head off for getting her some coffee, and one who manipulated me into spending my New Year's Eve at the old folks' home. The thought occurred to me that maybe life would be better if I had been born without a tongue. Especially now that I had to tell Lori I'd booked us an extra wild party night. I took the bus over to Lori's house, where she was sitting in her kitchen, in her bathrobe, with a coffee mug. I almost turned and ran when I saw the deja vu scene, but then, unlike my mom, she looked happy to see me. I had the horrible thought all of a sudden that she really was very pretty. When she hugged me, it was like Saul had put an evil spell on me. The curse of noticing Lori. I somehow managed to push the thought away, as we got ourselves arranged at the table, and soon I launched into a recap of the week's torments. It turned out, though, that Lori hadn't had the peachiest time in New York. My dad is nuts. No, my dad is nuts. Well, my mom is nuts. So's mine. Oh, yeah? I bet your dad isn't fleeing to another state to get away from you, Lori. I bet your dad isn't accusing you of treason for wanting to spend a few days with your mom, Alex. Well, that's just because my dad doesn't want me. Well, my mom doesn't want me, but I just went and spent Christmas with her, and she got me a swell present. Lori started to cry, which is pretty rare for her. What? She's pregnant. Wait, isn't she, like, too old? Apparently some random guy she met online didn't think so. And the grown-ups don't think we can be trusted together. Somehow, Lori and I wound up hugging each other for a bit too long then, until suddenly we both jumped up and away. Lori fled to the upstairs bathroom to take a shower, and I went to the couch, watched MTV, and tried not to dwell on the scent of her hair. Holding her had felt so right, and so wrong, that I knew it was going to be a long evening. Which reminded me. I hadn't told Lori about the groovy new plan for our intergenerational New Year's festivities. Fortunately, when she came back down and I laid the news on her, she took it well. Or at least she only hit me twice and called me the Nerd King. After a couple of hours shopping for snacks to bring to the oldsters, Lori and I stopped at my house to drop off her overnight bag. I didn't feel like facing my mom, but it turned out she wasn't home anyway. There was a note on the table. Hi, honey. I'm sorry to have snapped at you. I was upset, as you may have noticed, but everything will be fine. Also, I meant to tell you that Judge Trent called me. She's so impressed with your progress that she said you don't need to see a probation officer as long as you keep writing letters to her every few weeks. I am proud of you, even if I do not always show it. Love, Mom. P.S. I will be out with my date until at least midnight tonight. If you need me, I will have my cell phone on. I am sure you and Lori will be fine, though. Behave. P.P.S. 
I bought bagels and Philadelphia cream cheese, ha-ha, for tomorrow morning's breakfast. I look forward to catching up with Lori. See, Lori said, your mom loves you. Plus, she's not trying to pump out a replacement, baby. I didn't have a reply for that, so I just kind of patted Lori on the arm. She dropped her bag on the couch in the living room, and we walked out into the cold setting sun, our arms reloaded with chips, dips, cups, plates, candy, cheese, crackers, and even little noisemakers for Saul and company. At the home, there were pathetic little decorations up for the occasion, to supplement the lame Christmas tree from the week before, which was one of those artificial jobs that they create to give the illusion of a real yet sickly one. Why wouldn't they just make a healthy-looking plastic tree? They also had a dorky electric menorah, so the Jewish patients wouldn't feel left out of the overly commercial and transparently manufactured good cheer. And, of course, now they had added the horns and streamers, so the fogies could celebrate a new year of captivity. I was in a weird mood, I guess. Lori has always been one of those people who can just shrug off their sadness at will, though. So she jumped right into the party spirit, while I was gloomily filling cups with bright blue juice at the nurse's station counter. She was getting Saul up out of bed for a hug. It was incredible. Here was this guy who hadn't been able to walk three steps a few days before, and within seconds she had him hustling from room to room, inviting everyone out to the nurse's station. She even gave Claudelle a CD to put into their little boombox. I don't know where she got it, but it was this Christmas with the Rat Pack disc, which had nothing but Frank Sinatra and his buddies singing holiday tunes. Sal was almost dancing along, and the other residents were emerging from their rooms with smiles on. Lori even got Mrs. Goldfarb out of her room a second time, after Sal had temporarily convinced her that she wasn't wearing pants. Within moments, everyone was munching, drinking, and shuffling feet along with the music. God knows how, but Lori even convinced Saul and a few others to put on cone-shaped party hats that she had produced from somewhere. Even I had to admit two things. Lori was good at this stuff. And this wasn't such a painful way to spend New Year's Eve. I was almost starting to feel rather cheerful myself, right until Saul's fit. I was chowing down on these little pretzel morsels with cheese and pepperoni in every bite, and Lori was saying to me, You know, when you told me your sentence, a hundred hours seemed like forever. Can you believe you're more than halfway done? I was about to tell her how I planned to keep on at the home after I finished my mandated time, but a hand on my shoulder stopped me. The hand belonged to an angry Solomon Lewis. Wait a minute, Alex. You're not a volunteer? I'm your sentence? I'm your punishment? Oh, my gosh, Saul, I always assumed you knew. I was assigned to spend a hundred hours here by the juvenile court with the patient of my mom's choice. She picked you because she said we would be a good match. So now I'm a charity case, eh? I never thought I would live to see the day when I would be a burden for the state to put on somebody else's back. It's not like that. They thought I could learn from you so I wouldn't, um, you, you know, get arrested again. What in the world did they arrest a clean-cut boy like you for, anyway? Well, it was nothing, really. Nothing? Like what kind of nothing? Jaywalking? Skipping school to be with your darling here? No, I... I got drunk and tried to drive my mom's car to my dad's house. But it was no big deal, really. No big deal? You didn't hit anybody? No, I didn't hit anybody. Well, except a lawn gnome. A lawn gnome you hit? So you drove up on somebody's lawn? Well, yeah, but... And this is the no big deal? You're lucky to be alive, Alex. And you're lucky that you didn't kill anyone. No big deal, he says. You're even more my sugar than I thought. But just get out of here, you little criminal. Old I might be, and sick I might be. But handouts from a crazy outlaw who doesn't even know how stupid he is, I don't need. I was stunned. I noticed that the music had stopped, and the whole room full of people had turned to stare at me. Lori put her hand on my arm, but I shrugged it off and walked out. 
The last thing I heard was Lori saying to Saul, You know, that wasn't fair. He really isn't as bad as you. Then the elevator door closed behind me, and I was headed for the lobby. It occurred to me that I was still holding a little plate of food in a Dixie cup full of juice. Leave it to me to get shouted out of a New Year's party, at a nursing home no less, and make my dramatic exit dateless with snacks in hand. Oh well, if you're going to look like the biggest goober on the planet, you might as well wash down the lump in your throat with some nice cheese curls. When I got home, the light on our machine was blinking with a message from Lori's cell phone. Come back, Alex. All is forgiven. Stop being such a drama queen. Saul is even sorry, aren't you, Saul? She must have held the phone out to him, but all I could hear was a cough, and then a quick, Get ya, little car-crashing tuchus back here before I... At that point, Lori hung up in a hurry. There was no way I was going back there. By the time I hiked all the way to the bus, all the way back to the home, and all the way upstairs, all the fogies would be popping out their teeth, whisking off their wigs, and settling down for their sponge baths. It was much better all around if I took a nice shower, changed into raggedy old sweats, nuked some popcorn, and sat on the sofa for hours watching all the people with lives wishing each other a happy new year on TV. But after my long shower, the machine light was blinking a whole bunch of times. I pushed play with that sense of dread you'd get if you pissed off a karate master who had a key to your house. Sure enough, the messages got progressively worse. After the third one, All right, wuss boy, I'm on my way over there, and I am all pumped up to jump on you and start working your head like a speed bag. I just hit delete eleven or twelve times and waited for the invasion which came as soon as I curled up in an old throw blanket and settled in to watch the MTV Beach Party Unplugged Cribs TRL New Year's Rockin' Eve Bash. There was a rattling of keys, a turning of tumblers, and a whoosh of cold air. I was afraid to look, but the deceptively small-sounding footsteps were coming up behind me. Then, Lori did her famous somersault couch flip, landing just opposite me with her feet up on my legs. She took a long look at me, the mop of damp, uncontrollable hair, the popcorn bucket held protectively on my chest, and the tragic little boy frown that had saved me from her wrath a thousand times minimum, and reached into the bucket. She scrunched up so her face was inches from mine, blew her bangs out of her eyes, and said, You're too pathetic to kill. Hand me the remote, will you, before I change my mind? We had a pretty good night being pals as long as I didn't think about my mom being out on a date when I wasn't, or Saul evicting me from the home, or the warmth of Lori's legs on mine. We watched the New Year's countdown shows and played Monopoly at the same time, while I ignored the blatant cheating that Lori always referred to as her little bank errors. As payback, Lori lent me money to buy back my properties when they went bankrupt again and again. Just once it would be cool to think that Lori wasn't nine steps ahead of me at any given moment. But, hey, you can't have everything. When there were only ten minutes left until midnight, Lori finally allowed herself to finish me off in the game, and we went to the kitchen to make egg creams. An egg cream isn't as gross as it sounds. It's a New York thing. First you pour chocolate or vanilla syrup into a tall glass. Then you pour in milk. Then you spritz in some seltzer really fast and whip a spoon around in there. What you get is essentially chocolate or vanilla milk, but with an extra zap of fizzy goodness. Well, whatever you might think of the egg cream concept, the point is that Lori and I have been making them as a late-night snack beverage since Bill Clinton was president, and we aren't ready to stop yet. By the time we were done, pouring, pouring, spritzing, stirring, sipping, and cleaning up, it was 11.59. We stood very, very close together in the living room, and watched the ball fall over Times Square. At the big Happy New Year moment, we clinked glasses and drank. Then Lori wiped some chocolate froth off of my lip with one finger, and we stared into each other's eyes through the whole obligatory Auld Lang Syne saxophone serenade. At what I thought was the exactly, precisely perfect instant, I leaned toward her, suavely raised one eyebrow, and made my voice low and gravelly. How about a New Year's kiss? She laughed, said, In your dreams, buddy boy, and punched me in the arm. Hard. 
This prompted an outbreak of pillow-related violence, which was only quelled when I missed Lori's head with a mighty overhead clout and accidentally shattered both our egg cream glasses. By the time we tweezed the last glass shard out of the carpet and threw a towel on the floor to sop up most of the brown gooey stain, we were both feeling tired. So we set up our sleeping bags, did all our toothbrushing-type stuff, and lay down in the living room between the TV and the chocolate-coated rug disaster area. I was just drifting off to sleep when Lori reached over and put her arm around me. She murmured, You know, Sol really likes you a lot, buddy. Good night. And rolled back away from me. She fell asleep like she always does, almost instantaneously. But I was still lying there, half out of it, trying to ignore the loud tick, tick, tick of our kitchen clock and the ghost of Lori's arm on my shoulder when the front door opened. I didn't open my eyes, but I didn't have to. My mom had that loud whisper people use when they're doing a really miserable job of being quiet, and she was only fifteen feet away. Shh, she said. They're asleep. Then a man's voice answered. I see them. What the hell is that splotch on the rug next to them, though? I had a question, too. What was my dad doing here with my mom at 2 a.m.? Happy New Year! Okay, I admit it. I employed the fake sleep trick, at least until the murmur of my parents' voices eventually blended into the strange language of dreams. The next thing I knew, it was morning, and Lori was desperately spraying vast quantities of carpet cleaners on the chocolate amoeba that had nearly swallowed the room. Funny. I remarked. The stain didn't look so big last night. Well, now it looks like one of those giant oil spills in Alaska. I keep expecting a flock of endangered herons to come staggering out from under the towel and die at my feet. Hey, there's an image to drown out any ugly thoughts I might be having about my parental units. I dove right in and helped with the cleanup by spraying even more bluish gunk all over everything. Which, by the way, why is every liquid cleaner some shade of blue-green? Just wondering. Pretty soon, the stain was mostly a lovely fluorescent greenish-brownish-gray, if that's a color. And the smell was like what you'd get if you dumped a tub of toilet tank fresheners into a vat of melted Hershey's Kisses. Just then, my mom stomped down from upstairs, took one whiff, and fled back up with a hand over her mouth. I had that she'll-be-back feeling, though. Boy, am I smart. About ten minutes later, while Lori and I were feverishly brainstorming for either a solution or an excuse, Mom came down again with a sheepish dad in tow. We stopped trying to figure out a way to smuggle the entire room full of carpeting out of the house and started wishing we'd smuggled ourselves out instead. Since my social skills are so finely honed, I broke the ice. Hi, Dad. Did somebody put the city of Philadelphia upstairs without my noticing? The Rents looked at each other, and I noticed they were, uh, holding hands. This was an unusual scene, to say the least. Well, we, that is, I, your mother, um, okay, Dad, thanks for clarifying. Mom, can we talk about this later, Alex? Like, maybe after some breakfast? After all, we have company here. We sure do, I thought. All right, Mom, let's eat. But wait, Alex, what's that stain on the carpet? I smiled like a choir boy. Stain? Oh, you mean that little dot on the rug. I'll be glad to explain it to you after all the company leaves. So we sat down to the ABC special. Awkwardness, bagels, and coffee. All of which went down great with the lingering disinfectant and chocolate fumes. Lori kicked me under the table and rolled her eyes, as my parents chatted like two people who hadn't just spent twelve months and thirty thousand bucks battling each other tooth and nail through the legal system. I rubbed my shin and made faces back at her behind my coffee mug. When she got up to get more cream cheese, I caught myself checking out her legs again and immediately made my first New Year's resolution. No scoping Lori. And I didn't break that one for a good five minutes although my parents must have been breaking their own resolutions left and right. Whatever. 
Lori ate in a hurry and didn't say anything else until it was time to say goodbye to my parents. Bye, Mrs. G. Bye, Mr. G. I have to go to work out at the dojo. Thanks for breakfast. Sorry about the rug. Off she went, looking chipper. Sure, she was feeling good. She was off to karate kick things just for fun. And I wanted to karate kick my parents, but couldn't do that or have fun. Plus, I still had to cope with this weirdness and the rug issue. Hey, Mom, Dad, what's going on? Oh, no. Dad put down his coffee mug and pinched the bridge of his nose between his finger and thumb. Mom took a big swig of orange juice, pushed aside her glass, and nervously pulled her hair back away from her face. It had been a while since I had seen these signals, but they were instantly familiar, and I knew a big talk was coming. It's always been exactly the same. When my grandfather got sick for the last time, when I asked my daycare teacher why the classroom goldfish was floating face up, when I did the little skateboard roof thing, Dad pinches the nose and Mom does the hair pullback. Plus, the longer and more elaborate the pinching and pullbacking are, the worse the talk is going to be. So this time, when Dad fiddled with his nose for about half a minute until I was ready for his skin to start blistering from the friction, and Mom pulled her hair back so tight it looked like she had just gotten facelift surgery, I knew this big talk would be a doozy. Honey, do you remember yesterday morning when I was a bit upset? Ah, uh, Mom, do you remember the Titanic movie when the ship hit a bit of ice? Okay, fine, a lot upset. That was because your father and I had a long argument about his moving to Philadelphia. Then we agreed to have dinner and talk it over last night. There was this jazz trio playing in the corner of the restaurant, and they played our wedding song, and one thing led to another. Stop right there, Mom. I don't need to hear any more, especially when I just ate. So you're telling me Dad paid these guys to serenade you, and you took it as a sign from God that you should get back together? It wasn't like that, Alex. Was it, Simon? Well... Mom took that moment to demonstrate her unique mood-switching abilities. Wait. You paid them to play that song? You set me up? Oh, boy. Now things felt back to normal. Yes, Janet, I did. Mom took a deep breath and held it. So did Dad. I felt an instant cold sweat bursting out all over my back. Then Mom reached over and squeezed Dad's hand on the table. Thank you, Simon. That was really sweet. Wow. A double mood switch. I give up. Maybe things were never normal in this family. But Mom never stopped trying for normalcy anyway. Now, Alex, about that stain. Enter the Chuckings. On January 2nd, which was a Tuesday, we went back to school. In homeroom, I was talking with Lori about my problem with Saul when inspiration struck me like a ham-sized fist. Well, actually, a ham-sized fist struck me like an inspiration. Or something. I got punched and inspired. Here's how it happened. Lori, I was saying, how am I going to show up at Saul's place today? What am I supposed to say? I already told you he's not mad. That's just how he is. He blows off some steam once in a while. Oh, like you're the big expert on Solomon Lewis all of a sudden. Oh, feet-washing genius. Don't get mad at me just because you befriended an old man under false pretenses. I'm just trying to tell you things will be okay, that's all. And then came the fist, bashing into my right upper arm with 300 pounds of semi-blubbery football player behind it. Brian Gilson. Hey, lawn boy, I missed you over the break. Why didn't you come to Jody Krasilov's New Year's party? Oh, that's right, it's because you're a complete loser who's grounded for life. He sat down on the edge of my desk while I struggled desperately against the urge to rub my arm where he'd clobbered me. Anyway, I couldn't help overhearing that you got your geezer friend mad at you. Since I know you'll go to jail if you blow off your probation, and since homeroom wouldn't be the same without your sorry company, I'll give you some free advice. Lori was never much for staying quiet. Free advice from you? You just learned to speak in sentences like last week, and Alex needs your wisdom? 
Anyway, he's trying to stay out of trouble, which isn't exactly your specialty. Why don't you go impress your friends by walking and chewing gum? No, really. All you have to do, Dorkwad, is make the old man feel special. You know, like bring him a gift. The severed head of a lawn gnome, maybe. I crossed my eyes and pretended to think about it for a second. Then I really did think about it for a second. Then I got an amazing idea just as the bell rang for first period. I grabbed Brian's hand and shook it profusely. That's it! You are smarter than your girlfriend told me you were last night. Thanks, Brian. I owe you one. As I ran off in triumph, Brian and Lori were shrugging at each other, trying to figure out why I was so excited. It was like a little pixie bison bonding moment. Brian's advice had actually given me a great idea. This idea was amazing on about 17 different levels. One, it would impress the judge with my apparent selflessness and personal growth. Two, it would entertain and amuse dozens of oldsters. Three, it would make my mom think I might have some shred of redeemable goodness. Four, it was a chance to play guitar. Five, it might even shut Saul up for an hour. Okay, so it was only amazing for five reasons. Still, they were mighty big reasons. The idea was this. I would stage a benefit jazz concert at the home, with profits going toward future cultural events there. It would help people, and might even prove to Saul that he wasn't just my punishment. It was a win-win situation all around, and I knew exactly the people I would need to make it happen. The Chuckings. These were two members of my high school jazz band. Stephen was a superhuman drummer, and his eterna girlfriend Annette was a hellaciously gifted piano whiz. I called them the Chuckings after the sound that happens in a science fiction movie when two spaceships' airlocks are slammed together by the nearly irresistible force of a magnetic tractor beam. Chucking! That's how close Stephen and Annette were. I needed the Chuckings for this project because of the three things they loved nearly as much as they adored each other, which were jazz, being do-gooders, and their constant quest to create the perfect benefit concert. Why were they so into benefit concerts? Well, the obvious reason was that the concerts they put on together always involved playing jazz and do-gooding. But there was more to it. Three years ago, they had fallen in love while planning and rehearsing a benefit concert to pay the hospital bills for Stephen's little brother, Jeffrey, who had cancer. Even though Annette never got to play a single note at the concert, and Stephen had to run out during intermission to take Jeffrey to the hospital, the gig was a huge success. The bills got paid, Jeffrey became the unofficial town mascot, a position he holds to this day, and, of course, Stephen and Annette got each other. Really, it's so sweet I could hurl. The Chuck Kings are A students, of course. They are the most beloved couple ever to walk the halls of a high school without wearing athletic uniforms. They are jaw-droppingly good musicians, and they are very, very nice. Kind to animals, honor society officers... Patron saints of the key club. Very, very different from the mediocre guitarist, the car-thieving lawn no mangler, the convicted delinquent who would now be attempting to enlist their aid. Good thing I'm so charming. Oh, who was I kidding? These people lived for benefit concerts. If Stephen's mom were choking on a chicken bone, he would start the Heimlich maneuver while Annette started designing the poster for Bone Aid. They would jump on this opportunity. It was in the bag, right? I thought about my approach all day. We all had jazz band practice right after school, and then I would be heading straight for the home. So if I did this right, I would have the news of the concert ready as ammunition for when I had to face Saul. I decided to leave my last class early because Stephen and Annette had an independent study music class at the end of the day. That's how amazing these people's lives were. They had convinced an entire high school to give them a special daily period built for two. As for me, I had to practically promise my firstborn child to my pre-calc teacher just so I could miss the last eight minutes of his valuable instructional droning. So there I was, on the long hallway approaching the band room. As I got closer, I could hear the tinkling of Annette's piano, along with something else, like a clink-clink sound, but with different pitches and beautiful. 
I peeked in the little square window of the door and saw Annette playing chords while this complicated single-note line of clinks was floating over the top. It hit me that I knew the melody. Sunrise, sunset. Well, that was fitting. Stephen was playing the marimba, which is like a big xylophone thing with wooden bars instead of the metal kind. I hadn't even known he played anything other than drums. I hadn't even known our school had a marimba. But I guess that's why he and Annette were music gods while I was sitting on my tuchus in math class. I poked my head in the door, feeling a bit weird about breaking in on the musical dance they had going, especially when Stephen suddenly started embellishing the melody with all sorts of fast little grace notes that I wouldn't have been able to pull off on the guitar, much less on a second instrument. Annette was talking and playing at the same time, just in case her powers hadn't already been awesome enough. Okay, Stephen, that sounds great for the melody. Now, do you think you can add in the harmony line? I was thinking, duh, how can he play extra harmony notes when he has only two mallets? But then he did this amazing thing. He picked up an extra mallet for each hand without even missing a beat and kind of spread the mallets between different fingers so now it was like he was holding upside-down chopsticks or something. And sure enough, he started playing the melody and a harmony part at the same time. Finally, just when the insane skill level of these people was nearly too depressing to contemplate, he reached behind him to a xylophone that was set up there and finished his solo with one hand jamming away on each instrument. Annette and Stephen gave each other a little grin at the last note of the solo, and then in perfect unison burst into the little coda that ends the fiddler on the roof medley. When they stopped, I applauded. Annette turned to Stephen and said, Show off. Wait, he wasn't showing off that much. I kept waiting for him to light his mallets on fire and start juggling them during the solo, or play bass drum with his foot or something. They both just kind of stared at me like they had caught me beating a baby seal or something. I had forgotten that the Chakings are serious about music. Oh well, maybe next time. More staring. Hi guys. You're probably wondering why I'm here. I mean why I'm here now instead of after the bell rings. I mean, instead of in math, because that's what I have now. Math, pre-calc. Um, still more staring. Would the two of you like to help some elderly people in need? Their eyes lit up. For a babbling idiot, I'm a pretty good sandwich.